Patchwork Girl of Oz by L. Frank Baum Chapter 1 Ojo and Unk Nunky Where's the butter, Unk Nunky? asked Ojo. Unk looked out of the window and stroked his long beard. Then he turned to the munchkin boy and shook his head. Isn't, said he. Isn't any butter? That's too bad, Unk. Where's the jam, then? inquired Ojo, standing on a stool so he could look through all the shelves of the cupboard. But Unk Nunky shook his head again. Gone, he said. No jam either? And no cake? No jelly? No apples? Nothing but bread? All, said Unk, again stroking his beard as he gazed from the window. The little boy brought the stool and sat beside his uncle, munching the dry bread slowly, and seeming deep in thought. Nothing grows in our yard but the bread tree, he mused, and there are only two more loaves on that tree, and they're not ripe yet. Tell me, Unk, why are we so poor? The old munchkin turned and looked at Ojo. He had kindly eyes, but he hadn't smiled or laughed in so long that the boy had forgotten that Unk Nunky could look any other way than solemn. And Unk never spoke any more words than he was obliged to. So his little nephew, who lived alone with him, had learned to understand a great deal from one word. "'Why are we so poor, Unk?' repeated the boy. "'Not,' said the old munchkin. "'I think we are,' declared Ojo. "'What have we got?' "'House,' said Unk Nunky. "'I know, but everyone in the land of Oz has a place to live. "'What else, Unk?' Bread. I'm eating the last loaf that's ripe. There, I put aside your share, Unk. It's on the table, so you can eat it when you get hungry. But when that is gone, what shall we eat, Unk? The old man shifted in his chair, but merely shook his head. Of course, said Ojo, who was obliged to talk because his uncle would not. No one starves in the land of eyes either. There is plenty for everyone, you know. Only... If it isn't just where you happen to be, you must go where it is. The aged munchkin wriggled again and stared at his small nephew, as if disturbed by his argument. By tomorrow morning, the boy went on, we must go where there is something to eat, or we shall grow very hungry and become very unhappy. Where? asked Unk. Where shall we go? I don't know, I'm sure, replied Ojo. But you must know, Unk. You must have traveled in your time, because you're so old. I don't remember it, because ever since I could remember anything, we've lived right here in this lonesome round house, with a little garden back of it, and the thick woods all around. All I've ever seen of the great land of Oz, Unk dear, is the view of that mountain over at the south, where they say the Hammerheads live, who won't let anybody go by them, and that mountain at the north, where they say nobody lives. One, declared Unk, correcting him. Oh, yes, one family lives there, I've heard. That's the crooked magician who is named Dr. Pipt and his wife, Margolette. One year you told me about them. I think it took you a whole year, Unk, to say as much as I've just said about the crooked magician and his wife. They live high up in the mountains, and the good munchkin country where the fruits and flowers grow, is just the other side. It's funny you and I should live here all alone in the middle of the forest, isn't it? Yes, said Unk. Then let's go away and visit the Munchkin country and its jolly, good-natured people. I'd love to get a sight of something besides these woods, Unk Nunky. Too little, said Unk. Why, I'm not so little as I used to be, answered the boy earnestly. I think I can walk as far and as fast through these woods as you can, Unk. And now that nothing grows in our backyard that is good to eat, we must go where there is food. Unk Nunky made no reply for a time. Then he shut down the window and turned his chair to face the room, for the sun was sinking behind the treetops, and it was growing cool. By and by, Ojo lighted the fire, and the logs blazed freely in the broad fireplace. The two sat in the firelight for a long time. The old white-bearded munchkin and the little boy, both were thinking. 
when it grew quite dark outside, Ojo said, Eat your bread, Unc, and then we will go to bed. But Unc Nunky did not eat the bread, neither did he go directly to bed. Long after his little nephew was sound asleep in the corner of the room, the old man sat by the fire, thinking. Chapter 2 The Crooked Magician Just at dawn next morning, Unc Nunky laid his hand tenderly on Ojo's head and awakened him. Come, he said. Ojo dressed. He wore blue silk stockings, blue knee pants with gold buckles, a blue ruffled waist, and a jacket of bright blue braided with gold. His shoes were of blue leather and turned up at the toes, which were pointed. His hat had a peaked crown and a flat brim, and around the brim was a row of tiny golden bells that tinkled when he moved. This was the native costume of those who inhabited the munchkin country of the Land of Oz, so Unc Nunky's dress was much like that of his nephew. Instead of shoes, the old man wore boots with turnover tops, and his blue coat had wide cuffs of gold braid. The boy noticed that his uncle had not eaten the bread, and supposed the old man had not been hungry. Ojo was hungry, though, so he divided the piece of bread upon the table and ate his half for breakfast, washing it down with fresh cool water from the brook. Unc put the other piece of bread in his jacket pocket, after which he again said, as he walked out through the doorway, Come. Ojo was well pleased. He was dreadfully tired of living all alone in the woods, and wanted to travel and see people. For a long time he had wished to explore the beautiful land of Oz in which they lived. When they were outside, Unc simply latched the door and started up the path. No one would disturb their little house, even if anyone came so far into the thick forest while they were gone. At the foot of the mountain that separated the country of the Munchkins from the country of the Gillikins, the path divided. One way led to the left and the other to the right, straight up the mountain. Unc Nunky took this right-hand path and Ojo followed without asking why. He knew it would take them to the house of the crooked magician, whom he had never seen, but who was their nearest neighbor. All the morning they trudged up the mountain path, and at noon, Unc and Ojo sat on a fallen tree trunk, and ate the last of the bread which the old munchkin had placed in his pocket. Then they started on again, and two hours later came in sight of the house of Dr. Pipt, it was a big house, round, as were all the munchkin houses, and painted blue, which is the distinctive color of the munchkin country of Oz. There was a pretty garden around the house, where blue trees and blue flowers grew in abundance, and in one place were beds of blue cabbages, blue carrots, and blue lettuce, all of which were delicious to eat. In Dr. Pipt's garden grew bun trees cake trees, cream puff bushes, blue buttercups which yielded excellent blue butter, and a row of chocolate caramel plants. Paths of blue gravel divided the vegetable and flower beds, and a wider path led up to the front door. The place was in a clearing on the mountain, but a little way off was the grim forest, which completely surrounded it. Unc knocked at the door of the house, and a chubby, pleasant-faced woman, dressed all in blue, opened it and greeted the visitors with a smile. Ah, said Ojo, you must be Dame Margolette, the good wife of Dr. Pipt. I am, my dear, and all strangers are welcome to my home. May we see the famous magician, madam? He is very busy just now, she said, shaking her head doubtfully. But come in, and let me give you something to eat, for you must have traveled far in order to get to our lonely place. We have, replied Ojo, as he and Unc entered the house. We have come from a far lonelier place than this. A lonelier place? And in the munchkin country? she exclaimed. Then it must be somewhere in the blue forest. It is, good Dame Margolette. Dear me, she said, looking at the man. You must be Unc Nunky, known as the Silent One. Then she looked at the boy. 
and you must be Ojo the Unlucky, she added. Yes, said Unk. I never knew I was called the Unlucky, said Ojo soberly, but it really is a good name for me. Well, remarked the woman, as she bustled around the room and set the table and brought food from the cupboard. You were unlucky to live all alone in that dismal forest, which is much worse than the forest around here. But perhaps your luck will change, now that you are away from it. If during your travels you can manage to lose that un at the beginning of your name, unlucky, you will then become Ojo the Lucky, which will be a great improvement. How can I lose the un, Dame Margalette? I do not know how, but you must keep the matter in mind and perhaps the chance will come to you, she replied. Ojo had never eaten such a fine meal in all his life. There was a savory stew smoking hot, a dish of blue peas, a bowl of sweet milk of a delicate blue tint, and a blue pudding with blue plums in it. When the visitors had eaten heartily of this fare, the woman said to them, Do you wish to see Dr. Pipt on business or for pleasure? Unk shook his head. We are traveling, replied Ojo, and we stopped at your house just to rest and refresh ourselves. I do not think Unk Nunky cares very much to see the famous crooked magician, but for my part, I am curious to look at such a great man. The woman seemed thoughtful. I remember that Unk Nunky and my husband used to be friends many years ago, she said, so perhaps they'll be glad to meet again. The magician is very busy, as I said, but if you will promise not to disturb him, you may come into his workshop and watch him prepare a wonderful charm. Thank you, replied the boy, much pleased. I would like to do that. She led the way to a great domed hall at the back of the house, which was the magician's workshop. There was a row of windows extending nearly around the sides of the circular room, which rendered the place very light and there was a back door in addition to the one leading to the front part of the house. Before the row of windows, a broad seat was built, and there were some chairs and benches in the room besides. At one end stood a great fireplace, in which a blue log was blazing with a blue flame, and over the fire hung four kettles in a row, all bubbling and steaming at a great rate. The magician was stirring all four of these kettles at the same time, two with his hands, and two with his feet, to the latter wooden ladles being strapped, for this man was so very crooked that his legs were as handy as his arms. Unc Nunky came forward to greet his old friend, but not being able to shake either his hands or his feet, which were all occupied in stirring, he patted the magician's bald head and asked, What? Ah, it's the silent one, remarked Dr. Pipt, without looking up and he wants to know what I'm making. Well, when it is quite finished, the compound will be the wonderful powder of life, which no one knows how to make but myself. Whenever it is sprinkled on anything, that thing will at once come to life, no matter what it is. It takes me several years to make this magic powder, but at this moment I am pleased to say it is nearly done. You see, I am making it for my good wife Margalette, who wants to use some of it for a purpose of her own. Sit down and make yourself comfortable, Unc Nunky, and after I've finished my task, I will talk to you. You must know, said Margalette, when they were all seated together on the broad window seat, that my husband foolishly gave away all the powder of life he first made to old Mombi the witch, who used to live in the country of the Gillikins, to the north of here. Mombi gave Dr. Pip a powder of perpetual youth in exchange for his powder of life, but she cheated him wickedly, for the powder of youth was no good and could work no magic at all. Perhaps the powder of life couldn't either, said Ojo. Yes, it is perfection, she declared. The first lot we tested on our glass cat, which not only began to live, but has lived ever since. She's somewhere around the house now. A glass cat, exclaimed Ojo, astonished. Yes, she makes a very pleasant companion, but admires herself a little more than is considered modest, and she positively refuses to catch mice, explained Margalette. 
My husband made the cat some pink brains, but they proved to be too high-bred and particular for a cat, so she thinks that it is undignified for her to catch mice. Also, she has a pretty blood-red heart, but it is made of stone, a ruby, I think, and so is rather hard and unfeeling. I think the next glass cat the magician makes will have neither brains nor heart, for then it will not object to catching mice and may prove to be of some use to us. What did old Mombi the witch do with the powder of life your husband gave her? asked the boy. She brought Jack Pumpkinhead to life, for one thing, was the reply. I suppose you've heard of Jack Pumpkinhead. He is now living near the Emerald City, and is a great favorite with the Princess Ozma, who rules all the land of Oz. No, I've never heard of him, remarked Ojo. I'm afraid I don't know much about the land of Oz. You see, I've lived all my life with Unc Nunky, the silent one, and there is no one to tell me anything. That is one reason you are Ojo the Unlucky, said the woman in a sympathetic tone. The more one knows, the luckier he is, for knowledge is the greatest gift in life. But tell me, please, what do you intend to do with this new lot of the powder of life which Dr. Pipt is making? He said his wife wanted it for some special purpose. So I do, she answered. I wanted to bring my patchwork girl to life. Oh, a patchwork girl? What is that? Ojo asked, for this seemed even more strange and unusual than a glass cat. I think I must show you my patchwork girl, said Margolette, laughing at the boy's astonishment, for she is rather difficult to explain. But first, I will tell you that for many years I have longed for a servant to help me with the housework and to cook the meals and wash the dishes. No servant will come here because the place is so lonely and out of the way, so my clever husband, the crooked magician, proposed that I make a girl out of some sort of material, and he would make her live by sprinkling over her the powder of life. This seemed an excellent suggestion, and at once Dr. Pipt set to work to make a new batch of his magic powder. He has been at it a long, long while, and so I have had plenty of time to make the girl. Yet that task was not so easy as you may suppose. At first I couldn't think what to make her of, but finally, in searching through a chest, I came across an old patchwork quilt, which my grandmother once made when she was young. What is a patchwork quilt? asked Dojo. A bed quilt, made of patches of different kinds and colors of cloth, all neatly sewed together. The patches are of all shapes and sizes, so a patchwork quilt is a very pretty and gorgeous thing to look at. Sometimes it is called a crazy quilt, because the patches and colors are so mixed up. We have never used my grandmother's many-colored patchwork quilt, handsome as it is, for we munchkins do not care for any other color than blue. So it has been packed away in the chest for about a hundred years. When I found it, I said to myself that it would do nicely for my servant girl, for when she was brought to life, she would not be proud or haughty, as the glass cat is, for such a dreadful mixture of colors would discourage her from trying to be as dignified as the blue munchkins are. Is blue the only respectable color, then? inquired Ojo. Yes, for a munchkin. All our country is blue, you know, but in other parts of Oz the people favor different colors. At the Emerald City, where our Princess Ozma lives, green is the popular color. But all munchkins prefer blue to anything else, and when my housework girl is brought to life, she will find herself to be of so many unpopular colors that she'll never dare be rebellious or impudent, as servants are sometimes liable to be when they are made the same way as their mistresses are. Unc Nunky nodded approval. Good idea, he said and that was a long speech for Unc Nunky because it had two words. So I cut up the quilt, continued Margolette, and made from it a very well-shaped girl, which I stuffed with cotton wadding. I will show you what a good job I did. And she went to a tall cupboard and threw open the doors. Then back she came, lugging in her arms the patchwork girl, which she set upon the bench and propped up so that the figure would not tumble over.